This is Father Gregory Pine. This is Father Bonham Richard Chapman. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Pasca Venture. Here we are. We are. Right, we are here. here. Um, right. So it's been some number of weeks and or months since we last did a live stream. Oh, and uh, that number of weeks and or months is more than four slash one. That is weeks and or months. Uh, but it's fewer than a billion. Um, so True. it's good. Good to be here. And yeah. so far as you're you're a generous man, you often are here. I don't know well, that I'm here I'm as often as you are. I don't know. I, was, I lost because of some tech failures. Last I was supposed to be at the last live episode, live explaining. Um, mm -hmm. but the tech just broke down entirely. And so I literally jumped on. I was able to get the thing fixed with a one of those, what do you call it, little um hot spots or whatever? Uh, uh Jerry Rig. Um, Jerry Rig, yeah. I so I duct taped clothesline. Up, I duct, ta duct taped a bunch of like uh, cables together and then was able to generate a magnetic field to get the internet working. <laughs> so I did that. Nice. Did um, it involve a toroid? You better believe it did. A Gaussian, that sucker up. And yep. then I got on right when Father Patrick Mary had closed it down because he'd finished. He just went through it. So I like, so it was fine. It was a bit <laughs> like, so one of the earlier uh, Russian cosmonauts, I forget which one it was. Um, yeah. His, his, uh, his, was his, his name Alexei? Probably, um, cosmonaut comrade, com cosmonaut. Um, he was, he was having malfunction coming down, like so the the the, the capsule was going to blow up or something, and he was able to get out of the capsule somehow by some sweet Soviet strength. Um, but once Wait, he was out, was of it the Ivan capsule, Drago? I don't know. Once he was out of the capsule, he pulled his chute and it didn't work. Oh, which is like I think you get a free pass to heaven. <laughs> Like if you're a Pelagian, but in any way, I think you still get it. Like even if you're a Soviet atheist, just God's just like that's 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 on me, not you. You know, and so it's kind of like doing all this fiddling and stuff, and all of a sudden, like getting on right away, and it's like it's over, and you're like, yeah. oh man, now I know how comrade cosmonaut comrade felt. Um, <laughs> Maybe that guy's family subsequently won the lottery every time they bought a ticket for the next hundred years. I, I mean, feel like. That's the only way to write that wrong. Maybe there's no way to write, write write that wrong. Maybe it's not a wrong. Maybe creation is a relationship sometimes of dependence. Just, yeah, maybe it's just sometimes it's just suffering. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that was sweet, Soviet. That is that is so cool. I liked. I try to imagine what his experience like. You know, what would it be like? You you get through this. You basically like fight your way through space machines, and then you just pull this thing and nothing happens. I think yeah. I think you're just like you. Th maybe that's when you say, "I guess there's a god." You know. <laughs> Yeah, like, because I it's guess, like you got outside yeah. of the capsule that no one else in the history of humanity yeah. has gotten outside of. You're like, wow, by main strength. You and don't get then, to tell anyone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, although they knew, they all know. That's the thing, you're like, well, they're probably all going to know. Maybe I should write in Russian, my shoot didn't open. Um, right. Like, But they're all going to know, obviously. Um, yeah. So I guess that's like some consolation prize. Like you will be, you will live on in the memories of others in a cool, sweet way. But still... Now, I guess you might say, actually, like, well, I mean, you, if you can get out of a space, space capsule, man. Yeah, you should, you should be able to crack that code. You should be able to get that parachute open. But I don't know, you know? that's, that's Yeah, it. so, I mean, if your parachute fails to deploy, that's one thing. Because you can, like, you know, rootle around in your backpack and hope for the best. But then if your parachute deploys and it's, it's you know, off. flutters off into the abyss, that's I mean, right. what, what do you do next? I mean, you get back to, like, the, the duct tape and the pieces of, you know, twine... Yeah. And the Gaussian toroid. Yeah, generate the magnetic field and float. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think you'd probably try to fly. Um, yeah. You know, like put the arms out. Maybe you like do your best bird calls. Attract to yourself as many birds as possible. Then the twine comes in handy. Exactly. Yeah, right. I think you aim for some sort of airliner and hope just like back <laughs> off the, the shell. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, look, if you get out of the space capsule of death, you basically, I think, can solve anything. So I think he probably thought like, all right, well, let's, this is just a new problem. I wonder what I'm going to do here. Let's see. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if there are any dragons around. Yeah. <laughs> or just put your mind to like solving dinosaur extinction. Crack that code right before you hit. So like at the very least, even though you yourself will not have survived, you'll have figured out, like, you'll have figured out something quite significant that has nothing to do with the Yucatan Peninsula. Or if you can just like focus really clearly so that the minute you hit, you jump quickly. <laughs> or, or, <laughs> if you like roll just right if you just time the revolutions right to be able to whip off you know change the, the momentum 
into the circular motion as opposed to like just direct force on you. Like if you time that sucker right, you might yeah. be able to survive with a broken rib or two. Right. Uh, and then we'd have to. So there's a point where Aristotle says with uh, so the different political regimes, one of them is uh, so obviously absolute monarch is a possibility. But he says this isn't really likely unless an eternal king, eternal king shows up and then you have to just <laughs> obey what he does. Or you have to kill him. It's interesting. Like the church fathers love this. Um, but uh, so it's, or you just have to obey whatever he says. And I kind of feel like if you survive, if you survive death capsule and rolls that landing off, like people are just like, yeah, what do you want? Yeah. Can, yeah. Rule over us. Anything you want. Yeah. You're yeah. no Buckthorn. That's for darn sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he can go forward in time. Watch Live Fear Die Hard, the scene in which Bruce Willis takes down a Harrier jet single-handedly without an aircraft of his own. I think it involves him launching himself off like a cloverleaf on-ramp to a highway. And That's then right. having done that sacred study, he could revisit his situation and see what he can do about the aforementioned airliner. Yeah, man. I gotta look that guy up. Anyone in the comments can throw this in. Uh, just type in comrade, cosmonaut comrade. Uh, let's see. Is, maybe Alexi. It might actually just be made up story, the propaganda. Um, <laughs> but it's a story I distinctly remember, and as you can tell, have carried with me for a long time and have yeah. been thinking about. That strikes me though as a time when actions. propaganda was easier to kind of like, you know, yeah. suss out slash find out. Yeah. Um, so it's probably true. Everything that you said is true. Okay. So um, thank you for that. Uh, the theme of this here podcast slash live stream. Live planning. What do we call these things? Live planning. Just text planning on the end. Call it good. Um, is preparing for Holy Week. Uh, so the first thing that you're going to want. To... <laughs> the first That's thing that you're going to do is research. <laughs> oh, keep it together, Greg. <laughs> Come on, comrade. Ooh, Focus. Co research, comrade. <laughs> comrade, God, <but> not comrade. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, we're going to do five preparations for Holy Week sourced from our own experience um, that we found to have been fruitful, or maybe not, sourced from the ether, <laughs> sourced from other people who have done these things well and profitably. Any number of sources. Okay, so first, um, I think it's a fruitful practice to read a seven last words. I have read Father Romano Cesario's and Fulton Sheen's, and I've profited from both. It's just, you know, I mean, it, I suppose it depends upon the author uh, and it depends upon the depth of the meditations themselves. But it's always good just to meditate on those seven last words as a way by which to appreciate better and appropriate better the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's one. Father Bonamich, do you have a second? Man, yeah. So I was preparing to give a discourse on Odo Cassell and the Mysterian Gegenvart and the importance of that um, instead of like a list of five. But so we'll oh, say no, that. we. No, so no, let's zoom great. back out. This is actually no. going to end with a list of five, uh, but no, I anticipate it as a way by which to encourage our viewership to uh, persevere to the end of things that we say that might be thought by other people as boring, but certainly not by our viewers. So, um, Father Bonaventure, how does one enter into Holy Week, spiritually, mysterically speaking? Yeah, the second thing I would do is <laughs> make meditations across on Friday. That is a cool thing. Like, I remember yeah. I did something that, but it was really neat to... Uh, to do so you don't have to do like a really long one too but the kind of the genuflections because it has this rhythm to it you start going this is sweet and then it kind of gets like uh oh like really for another you know are there 14 really 14 but then at some point like you get in the rhythm of it and i think it's around 10 or something for each me for me each time it's like i like i'm here i'm in this story i'm in this kind of journey with jesus this kind of thing and 14 just kind of you slide out and you're like that's great love it Love it. But like from the experience from like four till till eight or nine is a cool one. And that's kind of maybe that's uh maybe that's how life's kind of supposed to go in some ways of like excitement initially. And then we kind of go through this. Oh, my gosh, do I have to keep doing this stuff? And then and then you kind of like if you, if you stay stay the course, then you're good to go. So it's a nice kind of recapitulation of of, you know, the practice of spiritual life in general. So stations across on Good Friday or someday um, this week. If you haven't tried that yet or haven't done yet, that's a good uh, way to do it, a way to get into it. Um, so another practice, uh, this is our third, another practice that we observed in the Pine family household growing up was to try to keep silence from noon until three on Good Friday. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're just focusing on Good Friday here, which is, well, why not? Um, so to focus on uh, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ in keeping silence during that time in which he experienced his agony. 
uh, or most acutely. Um, so, you know, like as little kids, we did our best, which is to say we didn't do that well at all. But it was something that our mother reminded us of um, often enough as a way by which to show our love or to show our affection, to show our appreciation, to show our devotion. So silence from 12 to 3 on Good Friday. Father right. Bonham, do you have a fourth? Um, I would say um, I'm going to read from Odo Cassell for a second. Yeah, that sounds um, right. And uh, so we've been talking about like also doing all these activities, but here's the fourth is don't do anything yes. itself, but get to a place where things are done to you. Ah. I think um, the, the mysteries of the faith in the sacraments <clears throat> and in the liturgy are not just like devotional practices we do, but rather things that we undergo, that we suffer mm -hmm. in a way. And I love this quote at the end of um, uh, the end of the introduction to Odo Cassell, no, first chapter of Odo Cassell's The Mystery of Christian Worship, uh, Mysterian Cult. Uh, he says, we need not go looking for it. He's talking about love of God. We need only give ourselves to it. Go about the celebration of the bridegroom's mysteries with the church, Christ's bride. In this, we shall ourselves be transformed in him and go his way with the son to the father. So it's kind of like strapping yourself. It's a it's the ascending version of the descending cosmonaut version mm. so you're strapping yourself to the to the son up to the father and the mysteries and i like that we need not go like we need not go do it ourselves we just have to undergo it so um take advantage of the liturgies that are at your churches or at your monasteries or at wherever you are and mm. just go there and let the church when you say what should i do for lent the church has said we've been doing this for a while mm. just go under this kind of the treatment of the sun s-o-n yeah nice um, <clears throat> I think that's, maybe this will be a point four B if that was point four A, this is point four B. I think there's a kind of temptation to take stuff with us to prayer because we're afraid of being exposed before God. It's like, yeah, um, I don't want to be bored or I don't want to be distracted or I don't want to be fatigued. So I ought to equip myself or even shield myself with various books and devotionals and whatever else. So there, there, it's good just to like experience the mystery of the Easter Triduum, or excuse me, of the Paschal Triduum. Uh, in all of its starkness and to feel a bit exposed in the process. Like Good Friday, you know, it's horrible. The church is empty. You feel that acutely. Uh, you should, you know, place yourself there and experience its emptiness. And you don't have to do anything with that. Or you don't have to like change that or better that or manage that. You can just suffer that. Apropos of what Father Father Bonaventure just said. So that's a, that's a 4B. Father Bonaventure, do you have a 5? It could be a 5A or a 5 in toto. Any thoughts no. about Holy Saturday? Read Baltazar. Um, nice. Yeah, I I don't know. Holy Saturday is weird, such a weird one because of... Uh, oh, well, I should say this. Um, make a visit. If you can, make a visit to a church uh, on during from Good Friday to Holy Saturday before the vigil because mm -hmm. the tabernacle will be open and all the things will be gone. The church will be empty. Uh, and there should feel this kind of the the, the neg via negativa of what Christ's presence is when we just get used to him, but mm -hmm. when it's missing... So, like to make a to make a visit to a chapel or a church from late Friday or more likely than not a Saturday morning or something. That's a nice time to visit and pray uh, quietly. Saturday morning might be a good one for that. Yeah, and this is the five B to that five A. Uh, if you are if you are in the vicinity of, or if you live nearby a religious house like a monastery or a convent of whatever sort, that might be a good opportunity to visit that place too, because religious tend to do up the whole um, like liturgy in somewhat fantastic fashion uh, mm -hmm. because it's like the whole point of our life. Um, so if we're not doing that, like what are we doing at the end of the day? We're just functionaries. Um, <clears throat> so that might be a good opportunity insofar as you have those mysteries commemorated in a peculiar way or a particular way in religious houses. So maybe a good opportunity to make a little visit there. Um, I've got a sixth point. I can't help myself. Uh, so, so we're supposed to fast twice a year by law, by church law, for those who are in the appropriate age range. Mm -hmm. which is what 14 to 59 or something like that yeah i think i remember looking it up and it's kind of tricky on the I remember it's bishop's conference like 64 maybe it's 59 ah. i okay. don't know yeah it's some number to other, some other number and you can look it up on the internet with greater efficacy than we ourselves can remember it such as yep. the digital age um we're outsourcing all of our memories <clears throat> uh whether to each other or to the void uh but uh so there are two days in which the church uh commends the practice of fasting and that means you know you just have one meal and if you're uh really hungry you can have like a little snack called a collation uh or two uh but that you shouldn't be snacking 
apart from that and that, um, yeah, you want to kind of feel the hunger as it were. And so that's, that's required of us on uh, good Friday, but it's also encouraged that you continue a kind of fast through Holy Saturday. Mm-hmm. You don't want to pass out at the Easter vigil, but, um, there's a kind of any climax to like breaking your good Friday fast while Christ is still in the tomb. So I'd say if you can, you know, make some kind of nutritionary sacrifice on Saturday, uh, mm-hmm. so as to better keep alive the memory of Christ's death until such time as he in liturgical fashion is restored to his people by the resurrection. Uh, so that's six with two, two part answers. So I guess that's eight. Any final thoughts? No, I'm just trying to figure out how to get my shadow thing working. Carry on. Oh, nice. So yeah, you got, you got a shadow thing. Um, we'll, uh, there it is. Nice. Okay. So while father Bonaventure is moving his microphone around and dealing with shadows and shadow games, um, <clears throat> we're going to start with some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And as it turns out, there were a lot of questions submitted ahead of time. But if we were to proceed through all of these questions that were submitted ahead of time, those who have submitted questions since the beginning of the live stream might despair entirely. Um, so what we're going to do is just read some of them, answer some of them, then bop down to the bottom so as to give hope to those who at present are following this live stream. Um, and then uh, we'll go back to the ones that are submitted ahead of time. I think I said the word submitted ahead of time seven times, seven times, seven times. Um, okay, so here we go. Here's our first multi-part question. Father Gregory and Father Holy Venture, nearly, I mean, probably true in the past. Did Mary know that she was conceived without sin? Was she aware that she lived an entire life without personal sin? Um, so Father Bonaventure, you're muted, but you needn't be. If you want to unmute yourself, the people of God would rejoice. Um, first thoughts on uh, the mother of God and whether she knew she was conceived without sin or lived without personal sin? Um, surely she knew she was living without personal sin, right? Because she would have yeah. known she hadn't committed any sin. Um, conceived without original sin. That category is tricker, trickier, but... I. Surely she knew, surely she knew something uh, that she was different in that way. But here's the thing. Um, If you were without sin, like you wouldn't, I mean, what would you, hey, look at me. Like that's Mm -hmm. just something that occurred to her. So even the question, even thinking about like what it would mean for her to have thought she's conceived with an original sin, would she have known it? And not in any way we would normally know it because we would know it from like imagining us as sinners, but turned out we're not sinners, I think. So it's even hard to think what it would be. She, I suspect Mary would have had like a holy simplicity uh, mm-hmm. to her. And so it would have been like kind of knowledge of, well, of course, like sin would have been unintelligible to her. So it's not like knowing, oh, I'm not without sin. It's like, I don't understand why you would. In a way, I mean, she does understand sin because she understands the sinners, but from a different perspective, she's never been from, had it internally. That's my just phenomenological suspicion, I guess. Yeah. Um, my my quick thought, I can't help myself. I always have to say stuff Do because it. I just can't help myself. Um, awesome. Well, uh, so we know that we were conceived in sin on the basis of revelation, but also it corresponds to our experience. Like it's born out and art out. It's born out in our experience. If Mary were to know, she would have known by revelation because it's the type Mm -hmm. of thing which goes beyond our knowledge. And so far as original sin is a revealed doctrine and its absence would seem to participate in that revelation or would be, you know, like of a piece with that revelation. Um, So it would stand to reason that she knew she had like great, acuity Mm -hmm. of knowledge that she had uh, a kind of plenary reception of the revelation of the most high God as befits her state. Um, and that she would have had some sense, but I think like you're right, it would have manifested itself as a kind of simplicity. All right. We're going to bop over the rest of Mitch's questions, at least for now. And then we're going to bop to a second. Mm -hmm. Hi fathers with it being Holy week. I've seen a few social media posts related to Judas. Mm -hmm. For example, the true test of Christianity isn't loving Jesus. It's loving Judas. I really don't know what to make of this. In other words, when you learn to sit at the table with Judas, you will understand the love of Christ. Can you help us properly understand the role of Judas? Thanks, Melissa. Um, All right, first thought for me is, we don't know whether or not Judas is is in heaven or in hell. The church hasn't pronounced upon that. Mm -hmm. You know, his final act as recounted in the gospel tradition is uh, an act of suicide, uh, which, you know, would be a mortal sin depending upon the circumstances thereof, but at least taken on its own terms, you know, is is a grave sin. But, you know, you have the example of the saints like St. John Vianney, who, when a man committed suicide in his parish, he said, we don't know what he thought or whether he repented. 
um, you know, in the final moments. So we we have a kind of similar agnosticism vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this particular sin. Um, so then our Lord loved Judas. We know that. Uh, and our Lord permitted Judas to depart from his will. Um, and our Lord foresaw it and foresuffered it and still permitted it, right? So like the Lord is not motivated by um, like minimizing sin or optimizing do-gooding, right? The Lord is motivated by glory and the salvation of souls. So this somehow fits within his providential plan for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. And so I think like in our own lives, we're called to tolerate uh, certain departures from the will of God amongst our contemporaries uh, to show them mercy, that is to say, to pity uh, their their kind of sinful state insofar as it is pitiable, uh, and then to seek to alleviate that by the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. So I think that we are called to a kind of love, even for those who might seem to us utterly beyond the pale or utterly beyond the reach of God's love. What are your thoughts by way of correction, perfection? Now you're good. All right. Um, this one's for you. How does the Catholic Church view the Jewish people? Are they still considered God's chosen people? And what does that mean for their salvation? Suzanne. Oh, man. Big one. Um, so <laughs> so I want to say, yeah. so this is this controversy came about because the uh, certain prayers were changed in the good, in the good Friday uh, prayers. Uh, I guess, are they still God's chosen people? Yes. Yes, they are still God's chosen people. Is their covenant still... How does, the, how does the covenant of the Jews relate to the covenant of Christ? Well, Christ is the fulfillment of this sort of thing. But there's a sense the church has um, that that they are a special people. So, pay, so if you listen to the Good Friday prayers, uh, if you go to a Good Friday service, you notice Jews are singled out. They're not like the pagans. They're not like the Muslims. They're not like anyone else. Um, they're of their own. They're, they're of their own people, uh, but they just need to be completed uh, in, in this way. And the church is, I mean, St. Paul, from St. Paul, talks about the that God never goes back in his covenant and that uh, Paul would will, be willing to sacrifice himself for his his own people. So there's a strong sense of that the election is eternal, um, and yet the Jews still, uh, that Christ still is the Savior and the Messiah of the Jews. So it's not like there's, let's put it this way, it's not like supersessionism, as it was it'd be called, where like Christianity has replaced, Christianity has replaced Judaism. Uh, in salvation, but it's also not two parallel tracks. Uh, it's also not like you have two options. You can either be Jewish or you can be, or you can be, you can be Christian, but it's something like he has a covenant faithfulness still with his own people and that he's still working salvation. And that as according to Paul, at least we Gentiles, uh, although we think it's, we're, we're the best thing since sliced bread, um, or at least manna from heaven, mm. uh, we're actually there to bring them back in. Like God still seems to care about the chosen people as a chosen people. And that's a big mystery, uh, I have to admit, and knowing what, what that's about. Um, but it is the case that he still cares about the Jewish people, and yet uh, Christ is still their Messiah and our Messiah in the same way. But um, that's I'm a philosopher. Maybe a theologian could kick in on here on this. Nope. I remember you explaining to me Romans 9 through 11 at one point, and then highlighting the fact that that, selection ends with the famous passage who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor <laughs> yeah so we've been grafted into that tree as to what that means going forward it's just hard to say all right hi fathers on the palm sunday lexio episode you talked a bit about music what kind of music do you like to listen to and has it changed father jacob bertrand mentioned music and i can't imagine him listening to music or enjoying anything just kidding but seriously That's uh true. love you all so much and pray for you every day thank you also i purchased two copies of prudence thank you one for me and one for our church library just finished it and it was excellent any chance i can get it signed unfortunately i live on the west coast and it's going to be difficult for me to get to a retreat although i will one of these days kimberly awesome um thanks and yes Certainly in due course. We'll figure out a way. Love will find a way. Um, Father Bonaventure, music thoughts, music preferences? You know, this I, I mean, I like the arts. I consider myself kind of a artsy fellow. Um, <laughs> but music, I don't listen to a lot. I really, <clears throat> I have a Spotify thing with a group kind of account. And so occasionally I listen, so I listen to some jazz. Um, and I, I hang out with one of our friars who loves jazz. So uh, we, do, we do, do jazz tomism. So I, I like I like jazz, Dixieland jazz mainly, uh, but also some good old uh, Brad from Masalis and and the and the gang. Uh, Josh Redman is excellent. Um, I like organ music a lot, but I don't listen to it. I like classical music a lot, but I don't listen to it. I like Alanis Morissette. She's my favorite musician. I do listen to her a little bit, but not a lot because it's mm -hmm. can't really study with it in the same way. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I, feel, I actually feel bad. It's like some people feel bad about not reading literature, I suspect. I feel bad about not listening to more music. Mm. I, on the other hand, unapologetically do not listen to much music because it gets stuck in my head and wakes me up in the middle of the night and makes it mm. difficult for me to go back to sleep. But when I do listen to music, female singer-songwriters, a la Alanis Morissette, Joni Mitchell is my go-to. It's not to oh, say wow. that I espouse all of her thoughts on all things, but the Blue Album, holy smokes, incredible. Mm. Um, and then I'm just like a... Just like a bro over here, just doing bro things and listening to my occasional house music. So cheers mm. to that. All right. Hi, Fathers. Currently en route to the airport for an Easter pilgrimage to Lourdes. I've never been there before. Can't wait. Have either of you been there? And do you have any suggestions outside of the ordinary to get the full benefit while there? Barry, yes. I have been there. I've been there twice. Once mm. when I was eight and once when I was 19. When I was eight, we went down from Paris to Lourdes as a family in a couchette. My sister pulled the emergency brake on the train. It was traumatic for all involved. Um, and then when I was there as 19, I worked for the North American Lords Volunteers, uh, doing a kind of like combination of volunteer services, which was awesome. I, I, I very much love Lords. And I would say my recommendation is don't worry too much about a get it done or see it all mentality. Uh, just spend as much time as you can in the sanctuary and profit from the various opportunities of visiting the baths, specifically the Adoration Chapel, taking part in the processions. So I, I wouldn't say, yeah, you have to put any pressure on yourself. You can just kind of take it in. Hmm. All right, here we go. Father Bonaventure, the issue that I'll be praying about and would love to get your thoughts on is on Lenten observance by abstinence versus indulging on Sunday or after Lent. I do offer positive changes to the Lord. I pray it attend a Bible study and am more zealous in my religious studies. However, there are things that I give up, such as alcohol and caffeine, that are also healthy to master. Uh, then there are things that I give up, such as cursing or speaking ill of others, that are sinful. Finally, there are things that I give up, such as social media, that are mentally healthy for a period. I understand that Sundays are the day we celebrate the Lord's feast and aren't part of Lent, but I'm uncertain what that means for Lenten sacrifices. Should I drink alcohol and caffeine? I find Sundays becoming my drinking days. It's tempting to schedule events at which I would like to drink on Sundays. Somehow this strikes me as wrong. I surely don't start speaking ill of people and cussing on Sundays. Finally, what should... I don't know that I've got all of that. Wait for it. Wait for it. Steady. Hold on. Let me get back here. Should. Search. What should... Aha! Got it. All right, found it. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to drop this down in the very bottom of the chat, which will make absolutely no sense to all persons involved. But here we go. What should my expectations for, be for myself post-Lent? Should I expect to simply take away lessons? Uh, should I aim to change my behavior by giving something up for Lent and then continuing to get up, give it up after? I'd love your thoughts. Father Bonaventure, get us started. Oh my gosh, it's huge, massive. Uh, I like it though. <laughs> um, so I gave so here. Uh, so, so as far as post Lent stuff, um, so I used to give up. Uh, I used to drink coffee with milk because I didn't really like coffee. And then so at Lent, I'd always give up coffee, uh, cream, and, and milk, and in the coffee, and just drink it black. And then for like three Lents, I actually liked black coffee. So that that was a successful penance, I guess. But penances aren't meant to be like just habit breaking. It, it might serve that purpose. You know, grace builds on nature, and nature help is is a rides piggyback on grace sometimes. Mm. So like that's. That's helpful, I suppose. But like, it's not meant for you to go, you know, I've got this bad habit. Good thing Lent's here. That's just an ancillary benefit from it. You know, the Lord's the Lord is, is bountiful in his mercies. Um, so, you know, feel free to rock back on, except for the sinful ones. And if you gave up sinful ones, it's weird. I don't know. You gave it, you gave it the tendency maybe or something. Um, the Sundays thing, I go back and forth in this. You know, some years I don't. So giving up drink, um, which is great. Some years I don't. So I don't drink at all during Lent or don't, you know, whatever might be giving up. And then other years I'll do like, a, I'll do the Sundays and the feast days kind of things. And, and I go back and forth on it, I guess. Um, you know, I, I do think it's, it's weird. It feels less Lenty for me when I do, you know, celebrate the feast days at the same time, as I reflect on it, I mean, we have to be careful of like Lenten Pelagianism as Americans and this kind of thing. It is true that we are this, that there was one good Friday that we're going to be keep you know, like redoing, but like we're on the other side of that. Like the resurrection did happen. So Sundays are not like they're, they're still Christ has risen. Uh, you know, Christ will come again kind of business. So yeah, I don't know. No, that's just, I mean, obviously the church had different practices through time. I think it's a personal matter, I suppose. And maybe you might like alternate to see which one you actually get more out of, because at the end of the day, it's about what what helps you mortify yourself more and bring yourself more in conformity with Christ. So that's just some two thoughts. 
My thoughts include, um, I don't think that there's a settled opinion on whether the Sundays in Lent are free days. I think that's just like a practice that some people employ, and it's a practice that some people do not employ. You need to know that when you count up the days of Lent, beginning with um, Ash Wednesday and continuing through Easter, if you include the Triduum, there are 46 days. So it's nice and convenient that if you take out the six Sundays, then you have mm -hmm. 40 days. Mm -hmm. But truth be told, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's not Lent so much as it is the Triduum, right, which is its own liturgical season, and you'll see that in the liturgical calendar, right? So there's no, like, clean way to count the quote-unquote 40 days of Lent, if we're being honest. Um, and when we celebrate those Sundays, we celebrate them as the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth Sundays of Lent, you know, the six we call Passion Sunday or the Palm Sunday of the Lord. So we celebrate them as Lent. We wear purple. We don't sing the Gloria or, you know, you, you know how it goes. Um, so I think that, like, liturgically speaking, we commemorate them as Lent. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a sense in which, like, doing whatever you want on Sunday is easier in one way insofar as your look forward to window is shorter. But it's also harder insofar as you never really get habituated to whatever it is that you gave up, to whatever that practice is. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're constantly doing, like, indulge and kind of uh, fast whiplash, which is painful. It's painful for the human body and it's painful for the human mind. Uh, so my sense is, you know, there's, it's always good to give up things that are sinful and we can use the grace of Lent as a kind of outboard motivation motor for that. And then it's good to give up things which alert us to our own need before the most high God, like mortification, not ultimately to alert us to that fact. Right. And then it's, it's just good to give up certain things for which we fear a kind of attachment. Um, we shouldn't be operating out of fear qua fear, but you get the idea. So I think that like, yeah, you're, you're going to find that the Lord will give indication uh, in the quiet of your heart as he kind of makes known the way in which he's drawing you deeper into intimacy, and you can trust that. Yeah. All right, here we go. Hi, fathers. Thank you for all you do. Related to the topic, I just mentioned the other day how strange I feel regarding Holy Saturday. Perhaps it's fitting, being the day after our Lord's death on the cross and before his resurrection, there's a mix mixture of sorrow and anticipation. Are there any traditions or specific things you recommend doing or avoiding on this day? Many thanks and prayer for you as you approach the Triduum Marathon ahead. First, a small thought, and then I'll send it to you. you kind of covered this um, I would say just dial down. Um, because it's a day in which most people don't plan anything, sometimes it has a kind of snow day-like feel where you're like, ooh, if I don't have a liturgical practice to attend or a homily to write or a liturgy to rehearse because I've forgotten it all since last year, then I can just get a ton of work done, um, which is like, that, that, that isn't how we used to think. Like when we were kids and there was a snow day, we were like, oh, free day. I'm going to go and sled and put Hershey's syrup on top of snow. And then my mom's going to make me tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich. And it's going to be awesome. Like we don't, we don't, we didn't think about it as a way to get ahead or a way to stay even. So I think that insofar, just kind of treat it like a retreat day fast uh, in the way in which we described earlier and pray. And then, you know, kind of keep that spirit as it were of both mourning and anticipating to the degree that you can. Father Bonaventure. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's not like the Christmas Eve kind of thing, but so you you are anticipating, but you're still kind of in that that sad that kind of sadness, depression, suffering. I think you're right to feel discombobulated or a little bit of anticipation. That's what's supposed to be going on because Friday is supposed to be this kind of shattering experience uh, for the disciples, and then like it's settling in, but not really going to end up settling in uh, for them. So I think I, I think I feel experience Holy Saturday in a bizarre way as well. I never feel like I because it also doesn't have like a liturgy attached to the way that the passion does until later. And I think the Triduum is about like being worked on again by, by the liturgy as opposed to you kind of doing something that you're kind of left just with nothing. What are you supposed to do? And I think that's, I think it's totally good to wander around aimlessly and feel like, what are we supposed to do? Because that is the mindset of the disciples at that, at that, that point of at time. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question, then we're going to pop down to the bottom. Uh, so dear fathers, two quick questions. Does it have to be holy hour? Or can it be a holy half hour? I started it during Lent as a weekly practice, but embarrassingly, I find it hard. I was wondering if building up to the full hour in smaller increments was an acceptable strategy. Um, oh, maybe this is a different question. Father Bonaventure, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, by holy hour, do you mean like you have, I mean, unless you committed to a holy hour, it doesn't have to be a holy hour, um, but you're right about uh, building up to things. I think people immediately think, oh, I'm going to do this. The holy hour is a nice junk, a nice, uh, 
unit. Um, but I, I tell people like, no, start small and build up. Like it's, it's better to feel like, wow, I could do longer as opposed to like, oh my gosh, how, how much more can this be? And it, it will, like you will get, you build, will build the muscles up, you know, the muscles for, for prayer time. So like a half an hour is a good start. 15 minutes is a good start for people. And then a half an hour from there and then 45 minutes, but, and then you'll just slide into the hour. Um, so I think increments are, are right, um, to, to do that. And otherwise, as you might experience, like you might not even do the whole a half hour if you think you have to do a holy hour because you'll feel guilty about it. So the increments is the, the tried and true method. Boom. Um, all right. So I'm bopping down to the bottom here, looking at a couple. Ingrid says some nice things. Michelle Lobo asks some great questions. And then we've got HD Moz says, uh, good evening, fathers. Not exactly related. However, my transgendered friend is slowly attempting to return to the church. Our question is, how do they go about presenting themselves? Mm. Great question. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, there's a sense in which, uh, like, I don't think that the church necessarily asks someone to reverse course. Uh, I, I think that, like, ideally, that person could get um, their endocrinologist, their spiritual director, and their, you know, kind of mental health uh, professional kind of in the same room to assess like what's good and what's possible. Because like, I, th I think some of these things are questions for scientists. Like, is it possible to reverse course, right? Or is this the type of thing which is going to just wreak further havoc on a person's body? Like if the person has already been doing hormonal treatment or if the person has had a surgery. Um, because obviously like if you can go back to how you were born, um, you know, by, by slow and incremental stages without visiting uh, great trauma on your body or on your mind or without wreaking havoc. Um, it seems like that's where you want to be. And so far as that's where God created you. Now, I think a lot of this question is confused in so far as there's like a lot of transgender ideology in the atmosphere, like in the air. But before there was transgender ideology, there were still people who experienced transgender dysphoria, right? So there's, it's like good to distinguish between those things and kind of like destigmatize in the, in the conservative kind of pushback against what is, yeah, whatever you get it. So, um, so I think that like get good counsel um, and like get good conversations going amongst those who are competent to make assessments in each kind of different aspect of one's life. Um, but but like there are probably going to be situations in which the church isn't going to ask you to go back. Um, and then in that instance, yeah, I, I don't think that we're dealing with uh, the type of thing where one has to say at every turn, you know, like my name is thus uh, and I look thus because of thus. I don't know, Father Bonaventure, help me uh, just kind of chat it through and talk it out because I want to be sensitive to the issue. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tricky, the, pr the presentation, uh, sense because it, it depends if the person has like physically transi transitioned a bit or whether this is just a, a presentation matter. Um, I think there is, I mean, we hate this kind of, some of this language, the law of gradualness kind of stuff. There, they, you got to bring the thing down slow. And it, it, there's this whole, was it this earlier this week? Yeah, it was Monday. Um, not meant to break uh, a bruised reed or smolder, you know, or quench a smoldering wick. And I think that's, I think that's true. You don't say things that are false. Like, so I think like the pronoun ones is, is, are tricky, but like if you've been using the wrong, a different name or something for a while, or if you're, or if you're used to wearing the things you've been wearing, you know, I think if there's movement, I think the church gets that. And I think people get that we need time to fix ourselves and to get back on shape. If the trajectory is right, I think it's important to talk to the pastor or to, if, if it's, if possible, uh, you'll find them, I think, hopefully sympathetic and just surprised and happy that the person reached out. But I think patience and mercy on these cases, if the trajectory is good, if the person is is aiming to get back and just is a little confused and, and, and uncomfortable, um, then you just take it as it goes and then reassess after time, like three months, six months, that kind of thing, and see, are we is this, how's this, how's this going? Is this feeling, is this feeling comfortable? Is there a thing we could do to get back to even more normalcy in that way? Um, but it's, I mean, this is, this is tricky. There are people who have put themselves through no fault of their own. Sometimes, sometimes it's just cultural manipulation in situations that how do you get out? You know, how do you, how do you change uh, this, some of these situations? So we have to respect that and appreciate the, the will of the person uh, to change and that goes a long way. Like in confession, I mean, I, th I think of, you know, I don't need perfect contrition. I need to see some signal of, of movement on this because it's so very important. This person receives the sacraments uh, and they and they want the sacraments and I'm t there to assist them, care be careful with them. It's the same way here, I think. It's really super. And it's okay to be, to just say, to 
you know, say, look, this might, I'm going to be awkward and comfortable. I'm going to say things that might not sound right. So sorry about that. Just help. Let me know um, as we navigate the situation, just being open and honest. All right. So maybe just uh, a couple of principles in review. I think that, um, you know, we're thinking about uh, the, the individual and his or her approach to God, reality, specifically the dispensation of the sacraments and the, you know, like life in the church. And what you want is truth, right? So there's a sin opposed to truth of comportment. It's called dissimulation. And you don't want to present yourself other than you are, you know, like we, we run the risk of um, kind of causing static, as it were, in our approach to reality, or of just hypocrisy, pretending to be other than we are, of like, you know, fraud. Um, now, often enough, when somebody has made a decision to live in this way, it's as a result of, you know, like certain psychological or emotional uh, difficulties that are presently being navigated, often enough connected with trauma. So like when we talk about the law of gradualism, we're talking about the way in which healing and growing often takes time and that the church can accompany in the midst of it. Um, which doesn't mean like compromising on the truth or doesn't mean adulterating the truth, but it means recognizing that there is no genuine impossibility or like perplexus where a person puts him or herself outside of the reach of grace, provided that that person is willing to repent and that person is willing to make use of the means that the church makes available. So I think in general, we're going to give indication, you know, like it's, it's best to kind of return to the way that God made you, but there may have been decisions made along the way, which make that practically speaking impossible upon which that's going to condition the way that the individual uh, lives and presents. But that's going to be highly specific to the individual. I don't know. Any further principles that you want to adduce on the basis of that? No, I, th I mean, it is a, there's, all, the principles are so 20,000 feet up on this one because there's, yeah. because the pr the practical, the specifics of the situation make such a big difference. Um, so, you know, but they have to be, they're more distinct than just mercy for, so whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. like you screwed up and we only accept one. So like, those are the two, you know, you want to be careful between those two, but the specific situation is, is a matter of sussing out in those details, but there's some, you've got the principles, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. All Maybe right. So Alexandria Hall one. Okay. Never mind. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to bop dude. Stations of the cross are wild. Certain grace for lost souls. If you visit a Catholic cemetery during the Easter season, I've never heard of one. Have you Father Bonaventure? I haven't. Okay, maybe I, I've certainly heard of special graces attached to visiting a cemetery on yeah. All Souls Day, um, All Souls, November second. Yeah. Yeah, but Easter, yeah. I hadn't heard. The angel addressed her as full of grace. He it's did. True. Yeah, yeah, it's he, true. It's, does that mean? Yeah, we take that theologically. We've seen that headed from from backside. That's that's an indication of Revelation two about about the Immaculate Conception. You could say, um, but yeah, yeah. That's it's still to be interpreted philosophically God, and theologically from hey, our perspective as to how Our Lady heard it and then responded to it. Yeah, yeah we don't know. Um, all right. Hey, fathers. Happy Holy Week. Reagan Quigley, who is Ooh. presently at the uh, TI Study Abroad program. So for her, it's like one in the morning. Um, so my guess is that she's not on this stream. Wait, no, she dropped this question in. She is on the stream. Life is crazy. Okay. So, hey, fathers. Happy Holy Week. One of my professors has mentioned a theory that St. Joseph might have been assumed into heaven. Have you ever heard of this or do you have any thoughts? I haven't heard of it. And I don't know that I have any thoughts, Father Bonaventure. Here's an well. Here's an interesting. First, I thought I say like not a chance, uh, but hold on. Um, I don't know if I've ever see, found ha, seen relics of Saint Joseph. Mm. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's not to say like well, obviously he's anyone we know of relics of is assumed, but it is you know, and he died early, so they weren't collected. But I mean, there's all sorts of yeah. I've never heard that theory. Um, I don't give it any credence, but there's this sense of like, here's what would definitely make it false. Um, if we had relics of him at St. Joseph parishes, we don't. So Modus Tolan <laughs> says this might there be right, but it doesn't mean it's true. It just means that it can't, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily false. If we had relics of him, it'd be necessarily false. So I don't know, but that, that does give me a pause for a second. Yeah. yeah. No, I hadn't heard. So, but Josephology is a, a kind of budding discipline at this point, kind of downstream of Mariology. So Father Basil Cole is one of our local experts and we can refer the matter to him. Mm. All right. Um, Diary of the Country Priest refers to Mary as younger than sin. Beautiful like analogy. That. Indeed. That nice. Wonderful talk. Thank you, fathers. Um, uh, Beardo Paperi asks, my parish is having the Easter vigil at 11 a.m. on Holy Saturday, presumably in an Eastern rite. Uh, I'm planning on oh. going to that and also to the Easter Sunday Mass, but wondering how to keep the solemnity, solemnity in between the two. Not a chance. That's a great question. Um, I mean. Yeah, good question. That's weird. I mean, it's like, it's common enough you, to anticipate in a lot of Eastern Eastern Catholic churches. 
yeah, but like you've celebrated like the Easter Vigil, you've celebrated the Christ and all this sort of thing, and then you're back, like he's back in the tomb, like he said, Hold on, I forgot something. Um, maybe yeah, that's yeah. Give it a go. I don't know. I mean, Holy Saturday's tough anyway. So yeah, you know, yeah. That's that's mm, interesting though. That's that's yeah. perplexing. I'd say spend extra time in Eucharistic adoration if it's available to you in your right. Um, but if oh, not, cool then... thing about, I learned about this Polish Polish tradition. You can ha they have Eucharistic adoration, uh, uh, before like before at some point during that the time when you normally wouldn't. So after Good Friday, it's like Holy Saturday, wow. I think, but veiled. Get out. So it's like kind of cheating, but also <laughs> with, I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. I just heard about it today, and I thought, oh, fascinating. So veiled Eucharistic adoration. So this is also yeah. in Sp Spanish uh, countries. They do this as well. Nice. I've Spanish? often found Spanish where we reserve countries? the Blessed Sacrament and gone and like prayed there, Spain? which is kind of cheating. Yeah. Sp well, Spanish-speaking countries. The Hispanic world. Well, right, we're going to bop back to the top. Okay. Father Bonaventure, we haven't even gotten through like half of these questions. I want to get Alexandria <laughs> Hall's question, though. She's got a great she had a great thing about Lent, and I, I want so we don't forget that one. All right, here we go. Is this it? Um, Father, two quick questions. Nope. Sorry about that. We already answered this I'm question. Don't worry about it. We'll I'm still that. struggling with joining in the suffering of the passion. I understand how via suffering we can get closer to God, or as Professor Stump argues, how Christ's suffering can lead us to surrendering to his grace. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it seems to me it borders on seeking suffering. For example, via Hallow app, I've been doing their Lent program based on Father Walter Chiswick's story, oh. glorious, heroic, and saintly. Yet I'm wondering, wouldn't he have served more people, though, in a more ordinary manner by just being, say, a parish priest? Wouldn't mm -hmm. that have been more prudent? Please, Father Bonaventure, explain to that what that is to Father Gregory. Nice. I don't know. Thank you so much, and God bless. Paolo. Paolo. Hmm. Um, yeah, would he have done better if we'd done X? No, obviously not, because God chose him not to do that. So, like, who cares? Um, I mean, no. I mean, right? It's so silly. We're not utilitarians. Um, he, yeah. it, it, Christ doesn't get... Christ doesn't give a rip in some ways about like moving stuff around with matter. He cares about like wills being conformed to him and lo souls loving him in this way. And some of them that's through suffering. Uh, it's the conformity he shares with us, not only the glorious and the joyful mysteries of the rosary, but also the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. And we only share those sufferings with those we love the most. So there's this great tradition that the, those who suffer the most are most beloved by him, not as a consolation prize, right like don't they're going to be the most loved by him but rather they're able to to be closest to him in some fashion now that's not to say like you know quick jump in the water and have a great white start gnawing at your thigh um you know because then you're getting closer to god but it because because suffering isn't something chosen you don't choose like the, this kind of christic suffering christ isn't going like i dare you to crucify me right he's just doing the father's will uh in the same way that those who receive suffering receive the father's will in the strongest way so it's in a matter of suffering is a matter of obedience that goes all the way through one's nature and that way it makes sense that it can form you to more to christ because it's more giving up canonically uh your own your own will to the father's will and suffering man nothing like giving up your will and suffering this is what lenten mortifications are for so so yeah it's tough to see because it looks like masochism on our own terms of like aiming for it but if you if you just do think about the passion and Christ's, you know, the way he chose to to redeem us, uh, then I think it has a, a sort of resonance to the spiritual life. And it seems to be the testimony of the saints. Boom. There's no way we're going to finish these questions. Your yeah. thoughts on guiding my second graders in our weekly 15 minutes of adoration. I've endeavored to catechize them well regarding the real presence and Jesus's love for each of them. Debbie, here's my quick uh, kind of recommendation. Acts. A-C-T-S. Start by adoring Jesus, and you can just lead them in prayers. Just say, like, tell Jesus how much you love him. Tell Jesus how wonderful he is. Tell Jesus how beautiful he is, you know, and just, like, let the kids mutter to themselves. Or maybe, like, you teach them a song, and you sing that song at the beginning. And then contrition. Tell Jesus you're sorry for the ways that you have not been good to him, that you have not been good to your parents, that you have not been good to your brothers and sisters, that you have not been good to your classmates. And you can mutter, or you can, you know, like, lead them in a rehearsed prayer. Thanksgiving. Tell Jesus how grateful you are for the gifts in your life, right? For your new shoes and your favorite candy and the day off of school on Monday and things like that. And then supplication S, ask Jesus for what you need, you know? And you might like focus on a particular kid or kind of put them in little groups in front of the Blessed Sacrament, or you might use like music at times, whatever it is. But I think you just kind of like teach the kids how to talk to Jesus, and that's great. Father Bonaventure, what are your thoughts on the ordinariate? presumably the Anglican ordinary created by oh, yeah. Pope Benedict the 16th. Do you think it's a valid alternative to those who perform more traditional, right? 
Good question. This is a great question. I'll try and answer as quickly as possible. So I, uh, so I am, uh, I am, I have, I have faculties to celebrate the ordinary mass in public, uh, in, in a turnum. Um, so, cause I served at an ordinary parish here. I do love the, I do love the ordinary for an Anglican or past Anglican. I don't know. It's like a deacon. Am I always in Okay. Um, so as a past Anglican, uh, I do find it, a, it's a little strange because it's a bit of a mix up of the, it's a bit of a, a, a mixed together fusion sort of, a Gellian synthesis of, of the, uh, of the Roman Missal and the BCP, the Book of Common Prayer. So it seems, it seems a little bit, it's a little comb combinatory, but it's, it's nice. It's beautiful. The language is gorgeous. Uh, it's celebrated adoratum by, in a sense, necessity of the right. Um, and it has some, and there are some beautiful. I mean, uh, the collect for purity, the collect for whole, of, of humble access. There's some beautiful prayers in there. That being said, I don't think. Now, um, by the way, cups from uh, one of our one of the seminarians for them, uh, the ordinariate. So this is uh, Mr. S Mr. Snodgrass. Uh, oh man, and there it goes. Um, Tremendous. It's great. So, so I love the ordinary. It's fantastic. I'm. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's a good like substitute. Like I don't. I. It's meant to be a thing. It's the the nature of it, the essence of it, the theology of it is that it's a place where where Anglicans could come in with their patrimony in the way that like Melkites and Marianites and all this kind of stuff. I think it's not this. It's not a right. It's the use of the Roman right. Whatever. But um, but there are some people that go, oh, my parish is kind of sucky, but I like this kind of English stuff and estimable and all that business. I'm not comfortable with that myself. I think that's not the point of it. Uh, but because we, if you're if you're not Anglican, right? If you're not Anglican use, then you're you're Roman, right? But it's it's perfect. It is acceptable to go to the Anglican use, and if you if you have one around you and have the opportunity to go to it, it's, it's good. And if that's a place that you want to 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 worship at and raise a family in, um, that's permitted. I just think it's a little bit. I don't know. For Romans are Romans. I was I was asked when I was a seminarian. And I was mentioning going to become a Catholic. Someone's some of the one of the Anglicans said, "Well, we'll just become a get married, become a priest, um, and then then switch over because then you'll be able to keep your stuff." And I thought, ah, eh, you know, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound with Rome. And that was with the sacramentary. That was before 2011, third typical. So that was tough, man. It's really tough. <laughs> All right, here we go. Question from the kids that I didn't anticipate and need to know if I answered correctly. If Judas had repented in the end, could he have gone to heaven? Yes, as yep. aforementioned. B, Boom. I've noticed that there's this thing that permeates church culture where it's like if someone has an inescapable misfortune, they are automatically lauded for their strength and declared a saint. It's as if the thesis statement is that holiness is inversely related to how much undeserved suffering you have or proportionately related. Faustina talks about how much we would appreciate our suffering if we could see it from heaven's lens and ask for more or something to that effect. I just can't believe the people who have nice and easy lives can't access holiness or have it less. Then what would be the point in pursuing the good? It just seems that like a kind of Stockholm syndrome to me. Can't there be a patron saint of a boring, cushy life asking for a <laughs> Hey, I respect that as an honest question from an honest asking person. For, asking, well, not that honest because that friend. Yeah. Wrote, <laughs> we get you. We get with you. the emoji. With the, Everyone with loves the emoji. Boats. Okay, Jesus loves boats too. Um, so my thoughts are, um, one, you're responsible for pursuing the good, but the good is God, right? There's only one who is God. Like, why do you call me good? God alone is good. And so when we talk about good and goods, there's only one thing good, and then other things are good by comparison to or arranged in a hierarchy, which is crowned by and ordered by the good God. So I think that we always have to have a little bit of a suspicion with respect to those goods because they're going to potentially trip us up or get us all attached to them because uh, they threaten to displace the one thing necessary or to kind of upend that hierarchy. So I think that there always has to be a little bit of suspicion in our lives with respect to those goods. Otherwise, we do get comfortable and then it becomes inordinately cushy. And I think that God is generous in affording us opportunities to do just that. It's not going to involve tons of pain and suffering necessarily, but it probably will involve a modicum of pain and suffering on account of the fact that we're human beings, right? That we're embodied souls or in soul bodies. And so we're always going to come up against things which hurt us or which diminish us or which otherwise kill us. And so I think that while we shouldn't go seeking out pain and suffering as if it were our you know, only hope. Uh, we shouldn't shy away from it on account of the fact that we're attached to or otherwise lulled to sleep by lower goods, which we fear losing, and in so doing, imperil our relationship with the good who is God. Any any additions? Any further thoughts? No, it's it's tough. It is tough. 
And then the last question from Alec is, any advice on the tension between despair and true Christian hope? Don't I need to be okay? Oh, maybe I messed that one up. Skip, darn it. Yep, skipped. Given we receive Jesus' body in the Eucharist, blood, plus blood, soul, and divinity, is there a distinction, whether it's his pre-resurrection or post-resurrection body, or are those two the same substance, even though post-resurrection he has new bodily powers? Same substance. Uh, yeah, well, it's, his, it's his, I mean, it's his glorified body. He only has <laughs> yeah. one body, and his right. body is in heaven, and wherever yeah. he shows up elsewhere, it's his glorified body. It just doesn't show up in the local fashion. It shows up in sacramental and substantial fashion, uh, but... More to be said on that by St. Thomas Aquinas. All right, Father Bonaventure, we're rounding the turn, and then we're going to go to the favorite question that you uh, want to have answered. Hello, fathers. Something I never understood is why we are called God's adopted children. If he made us, aren't we rather the children who returned him, like in the parable of the prodigal son, Victoria? Adopted because we don't share the same nature as him. Mm -hmm. Right? So we're human beings. He is God. Those are different things. But by the gift of divine life, that is to say grace, virtue, gifts of the Holy Spirit, beatitudes, fruits of the Spirit, we can share in his life or participate in his life, which makes us, as it were, part of his family and thus adopted. God has only one natural son, and his name is Jesus. I mean, I the son. This, I think in this, in the, in, it's, it makes less sense because we, we tend to like think of like animals as part of our families, like you have a bird, and you're like, this bird is my son. And you should be like, it's not your son. It's a bird. I love birds. Um, you know, but like, you don't have bird sons. Okay. Um, so like, but so, so it, they kind of connection between adopt, like, like a d child and adopted child in this analogy is again, sharing the natures. And we're like, well, I have families are just made up of all sorts of different kind of things. Like, no, actually families are made up of humans. Um, and then they have other accoutrements like birds. Bingo. It all comes back to birds. Um, so Karen says the Polish have a tradition of getting certain things for the Easter feast blessed on Holy Saturday. Oh, morning. yeah, they Beautiful do tradition. I recommend checking it out if you can. Yeah. yeah. Josie DeMartin says, hi, fathers. I'm making a pilgrimage to Medjugorje soon. Do you think it would be beneficial to learn more about the apparition or just to or just let to experience speak for itself, so to speak? Uh, the only thing I really know about Medjugorje is the fact that there is a controversy around it. But do you think it's necessary to know about Our Lady and the history going in? Thanks. Y'all are great. You could. You could not. I don't think it's too terribly important. Um, yeah, maybe read something on the internet or if you read something, you know, like read 25 pages, you don't have to read a whole book. Um, where would be, where would we, would be one good place to read the internet that was kind of unbiased. You just kind of like give them the stuff without, cause you could go on like a controversy site, but like, don't do that. What, is there any one site or one place that you trust? Like, yes, yeah, read this. You'll get at least enough background to enter into the, the mystery. Yeah. Um, Wayne Weibel is a guy who's written things about Medjugorje. The kind of okay. first book that was written about it was called Medjugorje, The Message, which is rather oldy timey. I mean, in the sense that it's like almost 35 years ago now that he wrote that. Um, and then as concern, so Father Leo, Leon Pereira is also another great source. You can look up anything that he writes. He's the English speaking chaplain at Medjugorje. Okay. Um, whatever nice. you find of his on the internet, I think would be fruitful. All right, here we go. Father Bonaventure, you ready? Ready. Alexandria Hall says, what if go. we failed at our Lenten penances, penances entirely? I battled it all along and returned to everything I gave up. I need some change of the will. Feel like I've failed. Your thoughts. Awesome. Number one, um, good lesson for next year about like, whoa, whoops, too much. Um, so humility is awesome. Humility is only learned through humiliation. At least it seems that way sometimes. But here's the cool part is uh, you are prepared for Holy Week. Um, because sometimes I think the Lent depends is if we haven't like failed at them in some capacity, I'm not saying like choose things that you will fail in, but if you don't have, you can feel like you just did stuff and you succeeded and then you get to good Friday at the cross and you're like, yes, I did your things. Whereas if you failed at your penances, like you are able to enter in, I think, and bring forward and say, you know, look, I mean, I've, I didn't even, it's not like I had to wait three hours or whatever. I just, I didn't even do like the little things. Um, so you're, it, it's good to like feel that fail. It, if there's a time to feel failure and not be worried about it, it's good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter vigil, because that's the whole shooting match. It's not like he did it once, got us on target. And our job from now on is to kind of like keep doing good things in moderation for him. It's, it's that we still need and depend upon him in every way it seems. And the, what we have done well, then keep moving on. We got other stuff. So like, don't feel bad, you know, don't go like, yeah, I'm gonna do the same thing next year. Uh, necessarily, but like, don't feel you're in a good spot. Like, welcome to being a Christian who needs God's grace. And the and the, the remember the cross is, if I remember correctly, God dying for you. So big deal, right? Like, it's okay. He's he's okay with the failure. He's he's got you covered. 
All right, we're going to we're going to ask three more questions in rapid succession. Can you explain how we can't know with the 100% certainty if we're in a state of grace or not as Trent says, if I've understood it? Basically, grace is invisible. And so we don't have access to invisible truths with mathematical certainty or absolute certainty. We can have a kind of moral certainty, which is like certainty that is proper to these types of matters. That's the type of certainty that you operate on when you make a prudential choice, for instance. Uh, it's not unrelated, I should say. And so you can like base it on certain evidential signs, like you do good things and you don't do bad things and you haven't done anything which you think would qualify as a mortal sin since your last valid sacramental confession. And you pray you, and you make and good you use love of the God. You're like, and you love God. Mean, yeah, exactly. And you ask you yourself, like, like, do I want to see Jesus more than other things? And you say, you know, I really do. That might yeah. be a good indication. And then follow-up question is, yes, you can email godsplaining at opeast.org if you have further questions. Gianzi says, should the 76ers re-sign Embiid? Yes, he loves the city. The city loves him. Faithful to a fault, even if we don't win a championship. Will the Eagles rebound? Yes. Super Bowl champs. And then... H.G. Moss says, thank you, fathers. I'll share this with friends and talk with our pastor soon. This is apropos of the person uh, yep. presenting. Uh, long story short, they've been presenting without the chemical transition since they've been cautious with the statistics and side effects of the chemical and surgical transition. Oh, Reagan says it's late. And just before inquiring about the chemical, what their doctor found a video discussing the theology of the body. God does have good timing. Tremendous. That's awesome. Um, Mitch, sorry, we did not get to all five of your questions. We only got to one, but we'll answer the other four at the men's retreat or Father Bonaventure will because he'll be there. Um, Joseph, where was he when Jesus was crucified? The tradition assumes that he was dead. Mm -hmm. It's on the basis of John two, where it says that the mother of God was there. And then Jesus and his disciples as well. They would have named Joseph if he were present or if he were alive, but seeing as yeah. they didn't, it seems that she had been widowed at that widow. Yeah. Widowed at that point. My father's. All right. We're not going to answer any more questions because that's our time. So thanks so much for having dropped them in. Our apologies if we didn't get to yours. Um, thanks as always for listening to God's planning. And there are things that we say at the end of the episode, but I'm not motivated to say most of them. If you'd like this, that'd be great. If you'd subscribe on YouTube, that'd be great. If you do other things that seem to get the word out, that'd be great. Also, we have a day of recollection coming up in Columbus, Ohio. Father Bonaventure and I will be on there April 6th. It's a Saturday at St. Patrick's. Godsplaining.org. Check it out for registration. It's free. So just get yourself there. It's going to be a party. And then we've got a retreat coming up June 7th through 9th in Malvern, Pennsylvania. You can go ahead and register at godsplending.org as well. It's going to be a party, and all five of us will be there. So we hope to see you at both of those events. And uh, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Godsplending.